Thanks for joining us. Good afternoon. I'm Rick Simchak. I'm a partner with Plunkett Cooney's Torts and Litigation Practice Group, and I help to coordinate our group webinar programming. Uh, it's my pleasure to serve as moderator for today's webinar, so let me begin by welcoming everyone and thanking you for attending. We all know how busy everyone is, so we really appreciate that you've uh, set aside an hour to join us for today's session. Before we get started, I'd like to take just a few minutes to provide you with some background about the law firm. For those of you who don't know, Plunkett Cooney is based in Southeast Michigan and is one of the Midwest's oldest and largest law firms. Approximately 130 attorneys and nine offices throughout Michigan, as well as offices in Chicago, Columbus, Ohio, and Indianapolis. Plunkett Cooney's Torts and Litigation Practice Group is comprised of attorneys across the region who focus their practices on various aspects of general liability, retail liability, premises liability, dram shop law, and related areas of litigation. Our attorneys routinely defend cases involving retailers, hospitality establishments, commercial property owners, and other businesses insured by some of the world's leading insurance providers. Today's topic focuses on how you can get ahead of litigation through the use of pre-suit investigations. As the title of today's webinar communicates, without a pre-suit investigation, what you don't know could seriously hurt your case when real litigation starts. Joining me today for today's discussion are three other members of Plunkett Cooney's Torts and Litigation Practice Group, Bob Marzano, Marissa Brunetti, and Nick Seward. We all work in the Bloomfield Hills office for Plunkett Cooney. Bob Marzano is a co-leader of the Plunkett, of Plunkett Cooney's Torts and Litigation Practice Group. He represents some of the world's largest retailers and restaurant chains in defense of their civil litigation. A partner at the firm, Bob focuses his practice primarily in the areas of premises liability, food service and hospital liability, general liability, and municipal law. He is a member of the Council on Litigation Management and previously served as the organization's Michigan State Chair. Marissa Brunetti is an associate attorney with Plunkett Cooney who maintains an extensive litigation defense practice. She has experience in such areas as general litigation, toxic torts, product liability, and class action disputes. Admitted to practice in both Michigan and West Virginia, Marissa is a member of DIRI, formerly the Defense Research Institute, and she's a firm liaison to Alpha International, where she is an active member of the organization's construction law practice group. Nick Seward is an associate attorney who has the distinction of being a certified fire and arson investigation technician. A, and a qualification which serves his clients particularly well in property damage cases. Nick also maintains a wide ranging litigation defense practice with expertise in water damage claims, fraud disputes, general liability cases, employment liability matters, and commercial litigation. He's a member of the Macomb County Bar Association and the negligence law section of the State Bar of Michigan. As for myself, I'm a partner here at Plunkett Cooney and been practicing for nearly 45 years with almost 30 years of those of that career spent right here at Plunkett Cooney. My litigation practice is rather diverse and includes premises liability, insurance coverage, motor vehicle liability, title insurance, and banking law. I also work closely with some of the largest insurance providers to resolve complex and high exposure matters. Before we actually start the seminar, I've been asked to cover just a couple of housekeeping notes about today's program. At the end of the webinar, we will take as many questions as time permits. If you want to ask a question, simply type it into the GoToWebinar questions window located on your webinar dashboard. Please note that today's session is being recorded, and that recording will be available on Plunkett Cooney's website, which is located at plunkettcooney.com. Once again, on behalf of the firm, thank you very much for attending today's webinar, and now let's get things started. In starting this, 
in starting this seminar, this webinar, uh, we think it's important to understand what the significance of pretrial investigation is or pre-suit investigation. When we say on the screen, obstacles, booby traps, and landmines, it's a communication that what can be discovered in pre-suit investigation can control the life of a claim and the life of litigation. One of the things every lawyer gets taught, and most clients, carriers, and third-party administrators learn, is nobody enjoys a surprise in an investigation. Nobody wants a surprise in litigation. So the primary goal of pre-suit investigation is to discover what are the hidden threats to your defense in the ultimate litigation. Now that may be too simple a statement. We might also want to preserve evidence or see the advantages in our defense in our case. But most people are even more concerned about what the threats are and what the weaknesses are. And that's why pre-suit investigation really clicks as an operation to help defend what, will, what might ultimately be litigation. But the difficulty is pre-suit investigation happens without all the benefits of actual litigation where we have the usual discovery tools which are triggered by the filing of a complaint in a court. So pre-suit investigation takes more. It takes more creativity, more thought, and more effort. But the reward for that effort is truly significant because it's knowledge. And in this case, as the screen says, knowledge is power. Knowledge is what neutralizes surprise. How do we gather that knowledge is really the focus of this seminar and what we hope to share with you today. Marissa, could you join us? Yes, thank you, Rick. So why are pre-suit investigations important? First and foremost, it gets you ahead and out in front. So I'm sure none of you on this webinar likes to be unprepared. So if you have the option to be prepared, then why wouldn't you take that opportunity? By engaging counsel at the very beginning, it allows him or her to invest the time up front to uncover the facts when they are fresh. Without a question, preserving the attorney-client privilege is probably the most important advantage to retaining counsel during a pre-suit investigation. As we will discuss more in depth um, later on, engaging counsel early triggers the protections of the attorney-client privilege when your counsel speaks with your employees and protects those communications from disclosure and formal discovery. It also identifies main issues and potential future issues. Similar to being prepared, engaging counsel for a pre-suit investigation puts your counsel in the driver's seat to map out what's relevant and what's not. It also gets him or her thinking about next steps, such as whether documents or video footage needs to be preserved and what witnesses to talk to. It also saves time and money because we, as we all know, justice moves slowly and is never quite in a hurry. So resolving a claim while it's in pre-suit could avoid having to wait years and years for resolution. A successful pre-suit investigation could also result in the resolution of a claim because it lets counsel evaluate the merits of the claim and determine if something is worth resolving or if it's defendable if litigation is pursued. And finally, if the claim does turn into litigation, you're already prepared. The heavy lifting is already done. Although not pre-suit, I had three cases at a previous firm where we brought it. We were brought into the cases late, but we did the heavy lifting, uncovered relevant facts, talked to the um, eyewitnesses, looked through all the documents, and that, um, based on our evaluation, we actually approached plaintiff's counsel and asked them for a, volu a voluntary dismissal because based on our investigation and evaluation, there was no way they could prove their claims against our client. In all three cases, we were voluntarily dismissed from those matters and we were the only defendants to be dismissed early on while all the other defendants went through the motions of litigation to only end up settling years down the road. And what are the components of a pre-suit investigation? Well, great question. Some of the most basic components of pre-suit investigation are things that we already know. They are identification of facts, of documents, the who, what, where, when, of any type of accident. Right. However, 
having held the council ask those questions, the what, the where, the when, cover those answers with a veil of privilege. Uh, additionally, outside counsel is the ability to bring in expert witnesses early, identifying and retaining those <clears throat> as quickly as possible in order to prevent loss of critical evidence and or documents that need later in the involvement of an attorney early also helps us coordinate and lead your team in a cohesive strategy to prevent any possible claim that gets filed, having united and consistent legal strategy. This incentivizes plan counsels to finally weaker or new cases. So the identification of key facts, if you do decide to pursue an investi a pre investigation, it's important to contact your attorney early. The earlier counsel is brought on board, the earlier the protections of the attorney-client privilege attach. And this is also a, a pertinent time for your counsel to figure out who is involved, what happened, why it happened, when it happened, where it happened, and how it happened. The more information your counsel has to increase the investigation, the better. It's important that your counsel doesn't wait until discovery begins to dig up facts and tackle them head on during a pre-suit investigation. Also, the creation of an internal post-accident or post-event report is important to document what happened. Understandably, most supervisors and managers are not experts in the, in the investigation of accidents. As a result, sometimes this information gathered by managers could be hit and miss where some where information is included in the report that's not so important while the important facts are left out. Having your counsel present will make sure will make for more meaningful interviews with witnesses and employees. Your attorney knows what to ask and what information to dig for, which is important for what information goes in that post accident report. Also, if possible, a designated person should be in charge of leading the internal investigation and preparing the report. This person can work with your counsel in arranging employee interviews and having the report prepared by one person ensures that the report is consistent and it's not a piecemeal effort by multiple people. Also, when creating these reports, be wary to avoid providing an opinion about how an accident occurred or who was to blame. We would rather have our experts provide an opinion about how the accident occurred. Thus, having counsel present during these interviews can help ensure that the correct questions are asked and the important information is obtained. At the same token, opinions recommending certain remedial measures that will prevent an accident from reoccurring should be left out of the report. This is not to say that if remedial measures need to be taken, then don't take them. What we want to avoid is a report that contains a witness statement from someone that's not qualified are knowledgeable about whether something was safe and that maybe it should be replaced or something to that effect. And it's important to keep in mind that we just want the report to be limited to the facts and observations. So engaging your counsel will be able to make sure that the correct information is gathered from employee and witness interviews and finds its way into those reports. So there's many different methodologies that you investigation and discover information that are also available. They, uh, they are important in, again, preventing the filing of new cases to resolve potentially damaging claims before they get the media. Uh, according to the initial statements from claimants, lock in their version of events and force them to be remaining consistent regardless of how fantastic Public records and information quickly identify plaintiffs or potential relationships with known fraudsters. Most people are lazy and tend to use the same lawyers over and over again. Being able to present uh, the numerous prior cases being filed by a claimant in the same law firm that uh, litigation investigation will enable you to potentially ward off nuisance for those of What, how do we identify those key documents and items? 
the identification of key documents and things, as you know, what documents are relevant will, will vary from case to case. But some with photographs, like the, the testimony of witnesses, will still be discussed below. Photographs bring life to an incident. It's important that if internal photographs are taken, to take photographs that preserve and illustrate facts and explain how an accident took place. For example, if equipment such as a ladder is involved, photographs should be taken to illustrate their condition at the time of the accident and the location at the time of the accident. Having counsel at the scene shortly after an incident has occurred is beneficial to determine what should be photographed. Also, having an expert present with your attorney is valuable because the expert will know exactly what he or she is looking for and what photographs um, they should be taking. In regards to video, if, there's, if there is a surveillance camera that captures the incident, it is important to preserve that footage. The last thing we want to happen is to lose critical video footage of an incident. Your attorney will be there to make sure that the video footage, if any, is preserved. As far as tangible evidence, a picture may be worth a thousand words, but tangible evidence can be worth a million. Like I said previously, some accidents involve equipment such as a ladder, and all too often, equipment involved in incidents are either repaired and returned to service or they're thrown out. So if a piece of equipment is involved in an incident, it's a good idea for a designated individual to take possession of the equipment or to photograph it and note any information to specifically identify it if you need to find it somewhere down the road. Understandably, not all tangible evidence can be preserved, but if it can, it's probably a good idea to do so. Preservation and electronically stored information. I'm sure this is everybody's favorite topic, but there's a duty to, um, to preserve any relevant information which arises when the party reasonably anticipates litigation. What does that mean? In general, a reasonable anticipation of litigation arises when a party knows there's a credible threat that it will become involved in litigation. So by retaining counsel early, your counsel will be able to assess the scope of your ESI and how it's stored. The sooner your counsel can get a handle on the amount of data that may be subject to formal discovery down the road, the better we are able to prepare. Also, the early identification of ESI helps avoid um, the pressures of a 28-day or 30-day time frame for responding to formal discovery if the claim occurred in litigation. It's also a good idea to alert IT to know to preserve electronic information related to the claim and to get your counsel speaking with IT to see how your information is stored and what your data retention policy is. Also a pro tip is to send a copy of your post event or post action report to your insurance carrier just to ensure um, preservation and that for some reason this report is not lost down the road. I don't think your insurance carrier is going to be upset that you send them this report um, for safekeeping. Moving on to the identification of potential witnesses. Employee and witness interviews form the backbone of pre-suit investigation. Like with pictures, the various accounts and observations from witnesses bring life to what happened. It's one thing to hear about something happening compared to actually seeing something happen for yourself. Therefore, it's important that counsel is retained early and doesn't wait for a deposition notice to sit down with employees and witnesses to explore their knowledge. Probably the most important reason to retain counsel early is so that he or she can establish the attorney-client privilege with employees. The privilege protects communications between an attorney and his or her client that are made for the purpose of obtaining or providing legal advice from disclosure. Now, when counsel deals with an organization or company, privilege attaches to communications between the attorney and any employee or agent authorized to speak on its behalf in relation to the subject matter of the communication. Opinions, conclusions, and recommendations based on facts are protected by the privilege when the facts are confidentially disclosed to an attorney for the purpose of legal advice. In order to preserve the privilege, your attorney should also take notes during an employee interview as opposed to the employee giving a written statement. However, it's important to note that it's the communications between your counsel and your employee that are privileged, but your employee still may have to sit for a deposition down the road if the claim does turn into litigation and testify regarding the facts 
namely what he or she saw and observed. However, the employee cannot be compelled to testify as to what he or she said to his or her attorney. The work product option could also attach to your attorney's notes as an extra layer of insulation from disclosure. Under the work product option, any notes, working papers, memoranda, or similar materials prepared by an attorney in anticipation of litigation are protected from discovery. The key takeaway here is that engaging counsel can establish the attorney-client privilege early and lock in an employee's testimony, whether it be good or bad. It's also important for your um, counsel to speak with everyone with knowledge, whether it be from the very top of the organization to the lowest of the low. In doing so, your counsel can sort out who actually saw something as opposed to someone who was told something by another worker over here, overheard something in the locker room. This exercise is similar to a child's game of telephone because as we know facts have a way of morphing and evolving as they are conveyed from one person to another. So by having your counsel speak with everyone, this gives your attorney the entire picture of what happened. It's also important for your counsel to speak with the employees as soon as, as, soon as possible after something occurred. The sooner an employee is spoken to after the accident or event, the better. As a new mother, I can hardly remember when I last washed my hair or what I had for dinner last week. I did a little research to see how fast our memory of an event fades over a period of time. When I found that it's within one hour, people will have forgotten an average of 50% of the details or the information of an event. Within 24 hours, they forget 70%. And within a week, 90% of the information. So it's imperative that your counsel speaks with folks immediately after an event or an accident to help ensure that your counsel is getting the most accurate account of what happened. Also interviewing employees shortly thereafter prevents your counsel from later having to track down important witnesses or um, employees that later left the company. Nobody likes talking to a lawyer as is, let alone someone that's left the company and is years removed from an incident. So the sooner that your counsel speaks with everybody, the better. It's also important to keep in mind that the attorney client privilege more than likely will not apply to interviews with former employees once they've left the company. So there's a case in Michigan that I found that states that counsel's communications with a former employee of the client corporation generally should be treated no differently from communications with any other third party fact witness. But there are exceptions, namely that privileged communications that occur during the period of employment don't lose the protection when their client or when the employee eventually leaves the client the corporation so it's important that your counsel is retained early and speaks with everyone that has knowledge of an incident so, so your counsel isn't worried about having to track down these former employees it also leads to the discovery of other facts and documents and witnesses because not every witness remembers the same details as the next witness i had a voting accident case last year where we had six eyewitnesses but my client was only able to give me two of those names. And after speaking with one of the witnesses, I, I um, was able to find two other witnesses and so I found the total of six. You know, witnesses are essentially the puzzle pieces that form an entire picture of an event. Therefore, it's important to get everyone's perspective of an event to have your counsel engaged early on um, in order to do that. Early witness interviews also help uncover which witnesses are your friends and will ultimately help your case. And it also helps uncover which witnesses are less than friendly and want to stick it to the company. It's beneficial for both clients and lawyers to find out which witnesses are favorable and which ones not so favorable before litigation ensues in order to adequately evaluate the claim. So one of the other early ways, one of the other ways that help evaluate claims early in litigation by the early retention of witnesses. Expert witnesses do more than just testify at trial. They assist in building a case. <clears throat> An expert can widen or shrink the physical scope of an investigation in order to support their legal defenses. They can, in the case of a uh, business, 
can open up parts of that business to continue operation while investigating or such things occurring or uh, ensure that only the specific equipment or machinery that's necessary uh, to be protected and prevented violation are important enough. <clears throat> they can speak the technical language of witnesses identifying potential hostile witnesses before their statements are corrected. They can ensure critical third-party evidence. Documents are identified in the subject of information that most important role experts have is a information is what items should and not be subject to testing, how scenes and evidence in advance can best be preserved for those The early retention of experts guide the claimants and experts towards scientific wisdom as an inquiry and away from hypothetical rabbit holes, which tend to be the basis of nuisance uh, lawsuits filed by plaintiff counsels. The most beneficial type of expert that can be retained pre during the pre-suit investigation are non-testifying experts. Well, these individuals are in the investigation and they have the type of qualified privilege that supports their analysis, testing, and findings from discovery and investigation. <clears throat> these experts can guide or provide claimant's expert with scientific data or other information to guide their opinion and as Claimant's expert goes, so follows claimant's turn. <clears throat> Institutions where all parties are not known are identified, but examination is kind of weird. And examination is sensitive. The expert can ensure that the examination meets the scientific method, uh, preventing possible spoliation arguments or hypothetical rabbit holes, which create questions of fact during litigation. This dovetails perfectly into the preservation of evidence and the avoiding of spoilation of evidence. Well, good morning. Actually, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Bob Marzano. I've been practicing for 27 years, and I can tell you that the topics that we're going to talk about in the next few minutes probably are the most important part of any litigation that I've handled. And it's it's imperative that these are handled properly. More cases have been compromised based upon lack of evidence uh, or spoilation of evidence. Uh, one of the major benefits of a pre-suit investigation is to first identify and interview key witnesses. This will include employees, non-employees, innocent bystanders who happen just to be in the area. It's, it never fails that when we get a case in after litigation is started, we'll have an incident report typically that will identify employees with knowledge. And when you talk with those employees, you'll find out, well, boy, there's three other people that aren't on this, li not on this list that actually have more knowledge than the people on the list. Uh, it is important to identify who these folks are at the very beginning. Oftentimes, Michigan has a three-year statute of limitation on premises liability negligence cases. Um, unfortunately, employees move from place to place. Uh, they die. Um, all kinds of interesting stuff happens. If we can get a hold of who these people are immediately after the occurrence of an accident, we can not only get their employment information, but also their personal contact information, such as emails, addresses and cell phones, which typically do not change over time. Oftentimes when I have asked a company, you know, I need to speak with so-and-so, and I've been told we're no longer employed with the company, it's okay, I need their last known address, telephone number, and email. Well, we don't have the email or telephone number, but here's the address. And this person's moved six times. Um, I've got a case pending right now where the key witness, the only person who has knowledge that could support our defense, cannot be found. And this person left shortly after the lawsuit was filed, before we could even get in contact with the person. Had this person been interviewed early on, most likely we'd be able to locate this individual. Now, as far as interviews that are conducted by investigators, 
or uh, surveillance companies. On, in Michigan, if you were a licensed private investigator, there is a arguable privilege that exists similar to the attorney-client privilege. Well, there's a statutory privilege that exists, but judges and other attorneys, very few people know about this, and it is a much stronger privilege to argue attorney-client privilege than it is to argue the licensed uh, private investigator client privilege. Uh, I've, I've seen recorded statements taken of employees uh, and other witnesses throughout my career, and Oftentimes, apart from getting the name, the address of the person, the very brief description of what happened, and the claim damages, there's really very little information contained that's helpful. Uh, knowing how to direct a witness, direct the questions that are being asked, are very important. And again, which dovetails into my next point, is that a witness's recollection of the events are much better immediately after the incident. Still fresh in the witness's mind. Time doesn't help, time doesn't decay all the different things that that witness may recall and some of the minute details that have occurred. Another reason why pre suit investigations are important is it allows us to collect reports and statements prepared regarding the incident. Many times, these statements that are prepared by employees or even managers are incomplete. Uh, it never fails that the most important information on the report is missing. Plaintiff attorneys love to focus in on, well, you've got all these different blanks to fill in here. Why didn't you fill this blank in? What does that mean? And you have to somehow explain that. It doesn't look good before a jury either. Also, you can assist in the preparation of these reports and statements too. Most of the employees that fill this stuff out are not what I would call sophisticated litigants. They don't understand the, you know, the information that needs to be put in or the information that really doesn't need to be put in. We can help guide them. We're not going to do anything nefarious here, but we can be there to answer questions as they're preparing the statements and the reports and make sure that the reports are complete. Um, oftentimes, too, uh, we get into a situation where it is a routine custom and habit of a company to have a report prepared. And we get the law student that says, where's the report? Well, we didn't get one in this case. And it'd be, it's amazing when the plaintiff attorney produces a report during litigation. So again, it's important that we make sure the reports are done, they're done properly, and they're also uh, provided to the right people who can store them in the event litigation occurs. Uh, along with reports and statements, it's also very important to collect inspection reports, store inspection forms, employee schedules. These things tend to disappear over the three year period. Uh, again, it never fails that you have an incident take place. You look at the hourly floor walk or the hourly bathroom inspection, and the one hour where this incident happened, or the one hour before it, there's a blank. And if we can catch it early on enough, we can take a look at the employee schedule, call the employees, and did you in fact do this inspection? When to when did you do it? It is very fresh in that person's mind, and we can correct that potential error. One year later, I don't know, six months later, no one's gonna remember what they inspected, what time they inspected it, or what they found. As far as surveillance video is concerned, I consider this, frankly, to be the bane of my existence. Um, oftentimes, surveillance videos are the biggest cause of spoliation claims in a lawsuit. As a premises possessor or owner, one of the main defenses in Michigan is lack of actual or constructive notice of the, of the dangerous condition. In Michigan, a plaintiff has to prove that either we created the dangerous condition, we knew about it, simply didn't do anything about it, or enough time had passed from when the condition was created that we should have known about it. Now, oftentimes, it's the third uh, element that I just discussed where we really litigate this. The plaintiff virus become quite clever and come back and said, listen, I've got a surveillance video. It shows my client falling on this liquid. What they didn't produce is a surveillance video showing how the liquid came to be on the floor. And of course, 
we call the, the store or the restaurant up with the facility and say, listen, I appreciate the accident happened at 102. Surveillance started at 102. Shows the person falling. It shows the person leaving. What do we have before that? Nothing. Why? Why would we have anything before that? Well, that's going to depict when this, when potentially depict when this allegedly dangerous condition came into existence. Judges typically will deny a motion for summary judgment, saying, "Listen, you had the ability to preserve this evidence, show when this condition could have been created. You didn't do it." And even if I'm not going to really hold you at fault for it, I'm not going to penalize the plaintiff by dismissing the case. We need all that surveillance. If we're involved early, depending on the severity of the accident, we can review the entire day's worth of surveillance. Another important part of collecting surveillance, other than just the incident happening, is what about the, the claimant that's in the store for an hour before the incident happened? Uh, where the person's having trouble walking or, you know, you catch the person drinking something that looks awful suspicious with their foot in their mouth. But what about after the incident? Okay, you filled out your incident report and then they go shop for three and a half hours. Didn't appear to be very injured. Again, a pre and post, you never know what you're going to find. And oftentimes, we're not going to know who this claimant is right away. So it's important, if possible, to retain as much surveillance video as possible, inside and outside. I know it sounds very tedious, but it can make or break a case where we can identify the claimant, follow that person from the time they arrived in a parking lot to the time they got in their car and left the premises. Um, I've had cases, too, where you have neighboring stores where this person you know, falls in our store, fills out an insert report, and immediately exits the place and says, hey, I went right to my doctor, got my car and left. Well, I went out there a surveillance camera and shows, no, they continued down the strip mall and shot for another two hours, got a bite to eat, then finally got in their car with their ice cream cone. Didn't look like they were in too much of a hurry to get to an ER. So again, that is something that can be lost quite quickly. Most uh, systems tape over themselves, and we need to pull that immediately. Another important aspect is to inspect the store as close in time as when the incident occurred. What conditions exist when this happened? Uh, you know, where are different things located on the property? Uh, people change their stores all the time. The restaurants rearrange all the time. Things are added, things are taken out. The quicker we can see what this looks like, the better we can visualize, document, and photograph exactly what it is that the scene looked like at the time of the incident. With respect to photographs, we also, too, again, we want to see photographs as close as possible to when the incident happened. Typically, photographs are your main exhibit in a slip and fall case uh, or some type of claim that something happened on a premises. I've had more clients Employees tell me, I said, where's the photographs that were taken after the incident? Well, we didn't take one. Why? Well, there's nothing to show. Okay, well, that's our whole defense. So it would have been nice to have a photograph of the area and said, look, it, there's nothing there. Michigan, at least for the time period, has an open eye to danger doctrine. Uh, the law says if an average person with ordinary intelligence would be able to discover a dangerous condition and avoid it, there's no duty to warn or maintain. Pretty good defense. There's nothing better than having as exhibit to your motion for summary judgment the allegedly dangerous condition. I literally had a case one time where the judge said, listen, I'm in a hurry today. Mr. Marzano, exhibit B, is that what the condition looked like at the time of the incident? Yes. When was the photograph taken? It was taken within two minutes of the fall. Great. Plus counsel, do you agree? Yes. Open and obvious case dismissed. I never had to say a word. They say a picture is worth a thousand words. Well, it is. Uh, judges typically, I, I don't want to say they're lazy with their overtax, perhaps, perhaps, but they don't like surveillance videos. They don't want to watch surveillance videos and try to figure out what's going on. They love photographs. They can look at them quickly, say, I see what it is, and move from there. Bob, one thing that this is one part of the pre-suit investigation where the client's involvement is really important because they're going to be there within a couple of minutes. This is where it becomes a joint effort, right? Correct. And 
I can't tell you how many times I've asked somebody, did you take any photographs? Because I've got two. Is there any more? This is a year later. Yeah, I took them on my iPhone. How many did you take? I don't know. I, it might have been more than two, but these are the two I gave to the store. Where's your iPhone? I don't have it anymore. I've lost it. My pictures have been erased. We've got a spoilation problem. And more important, we've got an investigation problem. Within a few days of an incident or a few weeks, we can get to that employee and say, listen, I need to download that phone, at least as far as these photographs are concerned. That way, we can represent this is everything. And we can tell the employee, you need to keep that phone until the dependency of this lawsuit is over. They'll gripe and complain about it, but nevertheless, it's very important that that's done. Uh, the key to all of this is to avoid the potential dangers associated with spoilation of evidence. The plaintiff's bar is extremely organized, and this is their big area that they come after people on, on spoilation of evidence. Uh, you, know, you have somebody that had an innocuous fall at your restaurant. You don't think anything big happened about it. No big deal, but you did fill out an incident report, or an ambulance did show up to take the person away, or you had to help the person to their car. So where's the surveillance video? Well, we didn't think anything of it, so we got rid of it. You've got a spoilation of evidence problem. I know it sounds crazy, but unfortunately, that's the way things are. Oftentimes, plaintiffs tend to get to their attorneys before defense attorneys are retained. Uh, the defense, the plaintiff attorney will immediately send a letter to the company saying, I represent so and so. Preserve any and all evidence you have, photographic, video, or anything regarding this incident. I will see these letters. I'll talk to my clients and say, well, okay, you got this letter. You have to do this. Well, no, I don't know who this person is. Or well, this person can't tell me what to do. Great. You were put on notice of a claim, and now we don't have that evidence. We're going to have a spoilation problem. And again, it, you're not going to win a summary judgment with a spoilation problem out there. You're going to get a jury instruction regarding a potential negative inference to the jury. And it's just not a problem we need to have. And before we move on, as far as early interaction with witnesses, whether it be employees or independent witnesses, if we're the first person to get to them, you can establish a rapport with these folks. Uh, they want to tell what they saw. Employees will feel comfortable with you. If and when there is litigation, they won't be a deer in the headlight. Oh, I have to meet with an attorney, and nobody wants to spend an afternoon with an attorney. But if they've met you before, it's, it's important that you have that relationship. Oftentimes, too, you'll speak with the witness right after the incident and say, okay, if you remember anything further, something comes to mind, here's my name, number, call me. I'll get calls from employees and even independent witnesses. When I was out raking my wheat this weekend, and all of a sudden this popped into my mind, I forgot to tell you about this. Or I think I told you this, but what I meant was that. That's important information. It means they're still thinking about what's going on and they're still bracketing their brain to go through what happened. If they, if we don't capture that information, it's sort of a brain dump, so to speak, it'll be gone. Now, as far as early evaluation uh, liability, obviously the quicker we can anal analyze uh, potential liability of an incident, the more important. Uh, key decisions can be made regarding whether this is a case that we want to try to settle early, uh, whether there's a strong basis for a summary judgment motion down the line in the event the case goes to litigation, or what is it we're going to need if we got to try the case? Uh, if it's a case that's going to trial, which you never know what's going to happen, really that march starts the day you start investigating the incident. Also, we can uh, begin making decisions regarding potential areas that will need further discovery, things we've got to flush out. Uh, there may be a lot of unanswered questions, but it's better to have a list of those unanswered questions knowing that, listen, we're not going to be able to evaluate this claim with certainty because we need to know this information. And finally, uh, key decisions can be made regarding potential helpful or harmful evidentiary issues. You know, do we have a spoilation problem right out of the gate? Do we have an evidentiary issue that we're never going to be able to resolve and we're going to have to either keep our fingers crossed, be upfront about it if litigation starts, or just have to get around it and deal with it. 
again, these are things that are important to learn sooner rather than later, especially in bigger cases. Oftentimes, what we find out in these pre-suit investigations are that liability is very favorable to the defendant, but the damages are extremely favorable to the plaintiff. Typically, why we do pre-suit investigations in the bigger case is imperative that we keep the plaintiff from crossing the liability bridge over to damage them. And in order to do that, we really got to hammer in that liability, solidify our evidence and our defenses, and be proactive and be ready to handle any claim that comes forward. We don't want to do this in a reactive way. Finally, uh, one of the key issues of a pre-suit investigation that is really is helpful is identifying uh, other potential sources of spreading the wealth, so to speak. We can identify potential third parties that could be involved in the incident whether it be a vendor, a subcontractor, another customer, who else possibly might be at fault in this incident. Uh, we can also look for express sources of express contractual indemnification. Uh, do we have contracts with the vendors? Uh, if you are a tenant, do you have a contract with the landlord or vice versa, where there is a uh, requirement that there's indemnification for common area maintenance, uh, you know, failure to maintain the common areas. Again, this is very important to look into. If it's a product problem, that you can put the producer on notice, the maker of the product, that hey, we've got a claim here, and we're going to tender it to you right now. You can go ahead and accept our tender of defense at this point. Let them pay for the pre-suit investigation. Let them pay for all this. Uh, the quicker you let them know, the better. Uh, and it also allows us to identify, uh, to point out to the plaintiff attorney possible uh, uh, parties. You know, I, I had a claim recently where uh, we had somebody that was killed on our premises, and the plaintiff attorney contacted me and said, "Hey, you know, listen, we do accept service. I'm going to see your client." And I said, "Yeah, well, you know, we've investigated this. You don't really want to sue us. Here's who you want. Here's the party that was responsible for handling this." And the plaintiff attorney said, great, thanks, appreciate it. I didn't want to waste my time with you, but I didn't need to, Bob. Uh, and we were never brought in the case. And I believe the case settled for over seven figures. So uh, again, that's doing your homework and being proactive rather than reactive. Finally, one of the key issues in pre-suit investigations is being able to determine if we need to file a notice of non-party fault. In Michigan, if a lawsuit is filed, a defendant can file what's called a notice of non-party fault with the court, identifying a party who may be or non-party who is not in the lawsuit who may be fully or partially at fault for the incident. And all you've got to do is put a short blurb as to why you think so, who that party is, last known contact information, if you if you have it of that person. The plaintiff then has 91 days to add that party or not add that party. It's key that we identify this as early as possible. Uh, again, the plaintiff attorneys will often say, hey, listen, you know, I've sued you. Are there any parties you think may be partially responsible or fully responsible? They want to bring these folks in right away. And again, the, the more liability you can shed to somebody else, the better. Again, I always call it spreading the wealth. And again, we want to spread as much of that as we can as early and often as we can. So, key takeaways from today. If somebody said to me, Bob, I've got about a minute to attend your seminar, what's the benefit of a pre suit investigation? Number one, in my opinion, without a doubt, preserving the attorney client privilege. Uh, everything what we do, as far as our employees are concerned, are, is protected by the attorney client privilege. And that is, that is worth its weight in gold. Number two is obviously you get. The, company, the right people involved in the matter and you get the nuts and bolts of what happened. And finally, and I think what's the most important is you preserve your evidence. Spoilation is again one of the biggest problems we have and it's typically in the surveillance video area. Um, I'm starting to see a new trend with plaintiff attorneys where their client says, listen, I fell at such and such place. There were four witnesses there. 
the incident report identifies two employees of the company. And they say, well, what about these witnesses? Well, I don't know, we didn't get their names. Or we talked to them and then we didn't write down their names or addresses. And I've seen, I'm starting to see a bigger trend where they're trying to make a spoilation claim saying, you had the opportunity to do this, you know, store manager, you didn't do it. Now these people are gone forever and we have nobody that can support us. I have not litigated that issue yet, but I think it's coming sooner rather than later. So again, that's something to keep in mind as well. Good. Um, as a reminder, uh, we would like and welcome questions. So to ask a question again, just type it into the questions window on the webinar dashboard. We'll give you a moment to do that. But while we are waiting for additional questions, we already have one, and that is, we suspect fraud in a particular property damage case. How would a pre-suit investigation assist us in this in the defense? Well, it's actually a really good question because how it would assist us is enable us to even get the case dismissed or ensure that the claim isn't even being in the litigation to begin with. A pre-suit, uh, when there is fraud involved, especially with a property damage claim, uh, preservation of evidence, which seems to be the largest topic that we're talking about today, is key in order to preserving any defenses that we have. And in the situation in which uh, it's an insurance company, they're trying to determine whether or not the coverage of the policy, uh, ensuring that there's an early retention of evidence of that fraud is, can form the entire basis for the denial of that claim and the ability to win on a motion for summary judgment in litigation that makes it that far. I do also want to mention something that I forgot to mention earlier about um, witness interviews. One of the other advantages of hiring and retaining counsel early is that your counsel could speak with the injured party or the injured person before that person lawyers up. This would give your counsel an opportunity to explore, you know, what happened when it's fresh in this person's mind, really assess damages, and this would also be used down the road if it does proceed into litigation, and now you have um, statements from early thereafter versus years down the road, and you could compare and maybe you could find there could be inconsistencies um, regarding what the injured party told your counsel during a pre suit interview as compared to what they told you um, during a deposition. So that's another advantage um, to retaining counsel early is to talk to the injured, in, injured individual before he or she um, lawyers up. Very good. Question that just came in. At what point during the pre-suit investigation should an expert be engaged? It seems odd to retain an expert before interviewing the defendants and witnesses would normally take, which would normally take place during the deposition. This is a question, again, pitched with regard to the representation of a plaintiff against a corporation. Uh, so the thrust of the question is, when, from a plaintiff's perspective, would you retain an expert prior to the deposition of the defendants? Well, I think it depends. It depends on what your subject matter is. Um, oftentimes, experts are retained to assist attorneys in conducting a, an investigation or obtaining certain facts or information that would be within that expert's field of expertise that you wouldn't think about. Um, you know, one of the areas, granted it may not be something you need right out of the gate pre-suit, but for instance, with respect to an economist on financial damages, the lost wages or future lost wages, uh, having an expert tell you, hey, here's the information that I need in order to prepare an analysis of this person's uh, potential for future earning capacity you know, make sure you ask these questions, great. Over time, you sort of learn, hey, a neuropsych's gonna ask certain questions, a plaintiff neuropsych doctor, and there's certain criteria they use. Well, you certainly wanna ask those deposition, those questions, you know, during a deposition. That's not a pre-suit thing, but again, it really, it depends on, on what the topic is and what expert testimony may be necessary. I think Bob makes some great points. And as it concerns to our topic of pursuit investigation, 
getting an expert involved from the very beginning to when we are actually showing up on site is also beneficial because the expert speaks the technical language of the individuals that we're interacting with, the people that we're taking from, that we're asking questions of, uh, especially in situations involving uh, technology, machinery, or other equipment where there could be multiple uh, different organizations that contributed to the manufacture of that device or piece of equipment, or it is highly specialized, having the expert with you from that initial phase enables you to speak a language that you may not be intimately familiar with from the beginning, and it also will help you determine whether or not a subcontractor's employee or subcontractor themselves is avoiding saying certain things because they understand the language of that specific or technical job better than you do, and the expert can help point that out to you right then and there so that you can investigate further. And just, just so we're clear too, it, we don't recommend this in every situation. If you have a person slipped and fell on a liquid, yeah, I typically don't need an expert to say that uh, water's slippery on the floor or ice is slippery in the parking lot. Uh, yeah, that's kind of a duh. Um, the plaintiff will retain an expert, and I can probably tell you in Michigan who the guy's going to be because he's on every case. But you know, my first question I say is, you know, what expertise do you bring to this case other than the obvious that ice is slippery? And I, you know, you get the deer in the headlights look from the person. Then, like when I ask that question, uh, but again, sometimes they're required, sometimes they're not. Oh, another question. Um, this comes from an in-house counsel who receives requests to preserve email, voicemail, correspondence, and in most instances, nothing comes of the matter. But even so, she notifies her folks and. Particularly, I need to preserve all emails of all certain individuals who deem, where deemed relevant to a matter. The question is, how long do we continue to maintain the hold on the potential evidence? Easy question. And first of all, it's a great practice that you're doing that. It's amazing how often it's not done. Uh, if it's a negligence claim, three years from the date of the incident. And if it's a contract claim, six, six years. years. So, and those are those are the minimums, but they're the amounts and are they're the maximums. But the idea is to go ahead, do that preservation. It may not work for eight cases, but the two cases out of ten where it becomes important, it will be invaluable. And the reason we're given three years and six years statute of limitations. Uh, last question, I think. If a witness refuses to provide information about an incident, can that be held against us? Well, it depends on who the witness is. If it's an employee, it could be a problem. If it's an independent witness, no. There's a, we can't, unless a lawsuit has been filed, we don't have any subpoena power to compel that person to appear to a deposition. Even with that subpoena power, you know, it, it's, it's tough to your option is going to be, hey, the person either didn't show up at a deposition or they showed up and won't talk about what happened. Judge, we filed a show cause order, ordered this person to say something. There's a good chance they're probably not going to say something that's going to be helpful to you at that point. You're not their friend anymore. And Bob makes a great point because identifying those people that there's any pre-suit investigation phase is extremely important because we know where the pain points are now. We know where we have issues. We know where we have deficiencies. We know where we're going to have evidentiary problems very early in the case, as opposed to after we're in litigation and we're subject to more order discovery. Very good. Uh, following today's presentation, there's an online survey that will pop up after we conclude. It would be very much appreciated if you would take just a few minutes to complete it. Your feedback is invaluable to us as we evaluate today's program and hopefully gives us the guidebooks to make these even more interesting and improve them. So please, please fill out the survey. Uh, additionally, if you're interested in learning more about our approach to general liability matters, please visit our website, 
funkycooney.com and check out our blogs. There you will find litigation, litigation Defenders blog, which focuses on the latest general liability case law, legal updates, and news. If anyone would like to access a recording of today's session, as well as the corresponding presentation slides, you can obtain them by visiting the event page on the firm's website. The two links will be at the bottom of that event page. Look, we very much appreciate your taking the time out of your busy days to join us for this event. Thank you very much on behalf of Bob, Marissa, Nick, and myself. And we hope you have a great rest of the day.